going to talk today about Jacques Ellul, the Technological Society. His book published in 1954 as La Technique and translated into English in 1964. <coughs> now, in the Technological Society, Jacques Ellul is going to be concerned with mainly human freedom and the ways in which human freedom is eliminated as a direct result of the development of technology. So something we can meditate a little bit on um, at some other point is what human freedom actually is, what it consists in. We can name a couple of things. However, we can say autonomy, true choice, absence of coercion, uh, things like spontaneity, serendipity, even randomness or mystery, which provides the condition for creativity, all these things uh, involved in human freedom. And he's going to set up this equation, right? There's an inverse relation. The more technology we get, the less free we become. I want to mention that he doesn't use the word technology that much. He uses the word technique. And by technique, he means something very specific. He's not talking about a single technology or a handful of technologies or techniques or even uh, machines or scientific methodology. He gives a definition, and we'll look at this because it's kind of an abstract concept and it remains a little bit vague even when we do define it. So uh, this is the definition that he gives. Technique, the totality of methods rationally arrived at and having absolute efficiency for a given stage of development in every field of human activity. So the totality of methods. I'm not going to spend too much time on the history of the development of technique because uh, Lul doesn't either. Um, just to say that contrary to popular belief, he believes that technique actually originated in the East, not in the West. And he talks about the Greeks. The Greeks didn't really go in for technique according to Alul. They made the strict separation between science and technique. The technique is concerned with yield in the broadest possible sense of the word. Right? And the purposes of technique, right? the ends of it, kind of incompatible with the Greek emphasis on uh, harmony, balance, moderation at the individual level and participation in civic uh, and political life in the polis. Right? These were the highest ends for the Greeks, not economic man. Greeks weren't impressed by that. So even with scientific folks like Pythagoras, Archimedes, Democritus, Plato, uh, Aristotle, and so forth, was the separation of science from technique, They're concerned with knowledge. The Romans, on the other hand, did employ technique, according to a little, and mainly organizational technique. So uh, techniques of uh, law, juridical techniques, techniques of conscription, military techniques. Uh, the res publica, and so forth. So Rome did go in for techniques. <coughs> there are three types of techniques that Alul talks about. I'm not going to discuss all of them. But we have economic techniques, organizational techniques, and human techniques. With economic techniques, we're mainly concerned with a production, again, with yield. But it also includes organization of labor, a centralized economic planning, and these sorts of things. Organizational technique basically is anything that has to do with the state. So administrative techniques, juridical techniques, uh, legal techniques, police apparatus, army, navy, and so forth. And finally, uh, we have human techniques. And under that umbrella fall uh, education, propaganda, medicine, genetics, uh, psychology is a really important human technique. Human technique takes the human being as its object. All right. So character of technique. There are a number of things that are really important here. <clears throat> when we talk about the ways in which technology tends to diminish human freedom, we're talking about human choice. What is freedom consistent? In many ways, free choice. One thing about technique is that it involves the cutting out of the human being, so automatism of technical choice. This is the example that Alul gives. Four is greater than three. That's just the fact. Our civilization is concerned with yield, again, in the broadest possible sense of the word, 
uh, yield, because we're not just talking about economic productivity, but in war, too, for instance, we have yield. It's just we count it in terms of human bodies, right? dead bodies produced. So yield. And four is greater than three. And it's instructive and interesting that he uses three and four, because in this day and age, we have like 3G and 4G. Say, for instance, your provider says to you, 3G or 4G, what do you prefer? It's going to be the same price. Well, obviously, you choose 4G. But this is not a choice, according to Lowell. We have no option but to choose in favor of efficiency. There's a new surgical technique, and you're sick. Well, you adopt that technique. There's no question about it. There's another important aspect to uh, automatism of technical choice. And that is that whenever technique comes into contact with something that is not technique, technique always wins out and either eliminates the other thing, right, that spontaneous domain, or it turns it into technique. What is the worst thing that a person or system can do in this day and age? The worst charge that can be leveled against a person or system in the technological society is that it is impeding technical progress. So he's going to give a communist critique of capitalism. Of course, he rejects communism and capitalism, right, in favor of a type of anarcho-primitivism, right? He's also a Christian, which is actually the only label that he ever identified with explicitly. He's going to reject communism and capitalism and nevertheless give the critique of uh, capitalism. So without rehashing all of the nuances of Marxism, basically, communism, capitalism. Capitalism is a class society based on class antagonism. Communism is a class-less society. The reason capitalism is a class society is because the means of production, in other words, uh, the factories, the farms, the land, are controlled by uh, just a handful of folks who then exploit the labor of other people. So a worker gets a wage in capitalism, and a wage necessarily entails wage slavery. Because what is a wage? It's a set amount. The capitalist purchases the labor power as a commodity from the worker, and it's set. So it bears no relation to the actual value that the worker produces. You get eight bucks an hour or something like that, doesn't matter how much value you produce. Whatever extra value you produce is appropriated. It's called in Marxist terms uh, surplus value. So that's appropriated, taken away. An extreme example, obviously, would be the sweatshop worker who gets paid maybe two, three dollars an hour, produces a pair of Nikes, uh, which are then sold for $159 or what have you. All that surplus labor, that surplus value is appropriated. Um, that's why Marx is able to say uh, that the program of the communists can be summed up in a single sentence, abolition of private property. And he goes on, right, paragraph later, to say, what do we mean? We mean property generally speaking? No, bourgeois property. In other words, we just take away the means of production from the capitalist class and redistribute them right, in the hands of the workers. So what is the problem with capitalism? What sort of critique will Alul offer? It's the fact that capitalism impedes technical progress right, because it subordinates technique to an artificial end, namely profit. It doesn't adopt all technical progress. It's concerned with profit. So again, in Marxian theory, we have these crises of overproduction, which are periodic. The distinguishing characteristic about capitalism, uh, according to Marx, is not actually class antagonism, because that's always existed. Rather, one of the distinguishing characteristics is the constant revolutionization of the means of production. In other words, better and better and better technology. But with this technology, we get too much good stuff, so to speak. Right? Too much stuff on the market. So supply goes high, demand falls, profits fall. And then we have what's called, in Marxian terms, creative destruction. Close some factories, eliminate the instruments of production, lay people off, fire folks. And then supply goes down, profits can rise again. So what we see is 
actual destruction of technological apparatus in capitalism because capitalists are only concerned with profit. There's another thing. What does capitalism do sometimes in the face of technical innovation? It actually stifles it. It doesn't align itself with technique. Because if you have a capital intensive industry and the bourgeois class, the capitalist class, has invested a good deal of money in a given technology, if a new technology comes along and it hasn't had time to pay off the old technology, it's going to stifle the new technology because, again, it subordinates technique to uh, the concern of profits. And an excellent example of this is if you've seen the film um, Who Killed the Electric Car, which in a nutshell tells the story of uh, the zero emissions law that was passed uh, in California, I think, in the 90s, and it required the seven major automobile manufacturers to work on electric cars as a condition of being able to produce and sell cars at all in California. So they did that. They were making some headway in terms of the electric car. But then, basically, a consortium of uh, oil concerns and the automobile manufacturers got together and kind of pushed the electric car aside. So goes the story. It doesn't take a human being to get technique to continue. In the first place, with every new technology, we have more technicians. Technique generates technicians and not the reverse. You have technicians to manage this new technology. So it goes along by itself. New technologies, more technicians. There's another thing. Because of the proliferation of techniques and technologies, we no longer have individual geniuses like Newton's and Einstein's. That's no longer necessary. It's no longer even possible, really. We don't get that. What we do is accumulate a whole bunch of stuff, information, data, and then we analyze it, much as a computer would. Whoever's kind of in the know, has all the relevant information, is able to make the new discovery. It's kind of an inexorable logic. It's this internal logic to the development of technique, self-augmentation. So for instance, if you look at some of the newer inventions, right, the impressive ones of our era, what you see is they're not sort of earth-shattering things. You take uh, Bill Gates and Windows, you just kind of synthesize stuff. Uh, more recently, Mark Zuckerberg, right, Facebook. If um, the movie, The Social Network, is to be believed, it was like a bunch of people were kind of on the same path towards inventing something, and maybe Mark Zuckerberg shut them out and combined a few things, and you get Facebook. Pretty much anyone can do it. And this is the self-augmentation that we see. Uh, so a couple of laws in terms of self-augmentation. Uh, one is that technological progress, technique, is irreversible. Once technique has been applied in a certain domain, you can't go back. There's no going back. And it expands. It doesn't expand arithmetically, but according to a little uh, geometrically. And it's interesting that he says that, too, because the futurist AI guy, Ray Kurzweil, right, now says that as we move towards the singularity, the fusion of biological and machine intelligence, we're actually seeing exponential progress. So it's no longer even geometric. But little by little, technique, rationality, systematicity is applied to new domains, and the domains in particular that were once considered absolutely spontaneous. In Chinese, uh, the word su chan refers to both nature and spontaneity. So we're often thinking about sort of natural things. <clears throat> and I think a good example of the way technique uh, sort of expands, covers new domains and conquers, as it were, is maybe the question of like something Online dating it seemed maybe a little bit weird a decade ago. Like you just meet somebody online and then you go date, and meet. That seems strange. Now it seems perfectly logical and in certain senses even more natural than just randomly meeting someone at a bar because that depends on circumstance. Whereas if you have online dating, that is taken out of the equation. Technique is applied in this domain of intimacy, love, sex, and it's really much more effective and efficient because it aligns with technique. 
So you just get people that you're compatible with. You send them a message, and they send you messages. You line up uh, people, you get more dates. It's kind of better, in a certain sense. It transcends the boundaries of time and of space. You don't have to be in that particular town, at that particular time, in that bar, and meet that person. So the technique expands, and it's irreversible once it does expand into a particular domain. So monism. This is a really important element of technique, monism. So, mono, one. Monism refers to two things, two elements in the character of technique. The first of all, it's the interdependency between all technologies. They operate on similar physical uh, laws, similar principles. You can't have a computer without a transistor. You can't have a cell phone without a satellite. You can't have any of these things without trucks and planes to ship them along. So it refers to this interdependency. It's inescapable. But it also refers to something even more important. And this is the fact that you can't separate the good from the bad applications of technique. It flies in the face of conventional wisdom, which says we have this fact-value distinction. Oh, we have one technology. It can be used for good or for evil. It all depends. We have to make that decision. And Jacques Lul says no, no. He has this formulation. And content is inseparable from use, which is inseparable from being. It means that if a thing is invented, it must be used. And there's a sequence of developments. That sequence will be followed. So he gives the example of uh, the atomic bomb, nuclear power. We could say nuclear energy. That has a few different applications. We can bomb people, like destroy cities, or we can create energy that's cheap, efficient, and so forth. But in fact, says Alul, the logic of technique requires that we go through the bomb stage. It's automatic. It's not a question of evil motives necessarily among human beings or even as a function of war and necessity. It's not like that at all. Rather, the logic of technique dictates that we bomb people first. We have to bomb people first because it's simply easier, technically and scientifically speaking, to split the atom and release the energy than to split the atom and harness the energy. We may be able to do that, and we sometimes do it now, right? But logically speaking, it has to occur in that sequence. Just easier, technically. So we have to have the bomb. And again, with monism. Finally, universalism. This refers to the diffusion of technique. Technique diffuses, and it tends towards homogenization across cultures. This universalism. An aspect of this, too, are the catastrophes that we see. Do we have to accept the fact that technique automatically causes catastrophe? Not necessarily. But it does tend to, according to Alul. Uh, for instance, environmental catastrophes. Anytime we adopt these techniques, they give rise to problems and disasters that are much worse than the situation that would have obtained had we not introduced the technique in the first place. So um, of course, indigenous cultures obviously recognize the environmental uh, repercussions, the introduction of these techniques. Alul did too, which is not too bad for a European in the 1950s. Um, but it's just like, OK, chemical pesticides, DDT, deforestation, destruction of habitat. These things are a function of technique. How do we resolve these things? Well, technical problems can only be uh, resolved by the application of technical solutions. So what's the most effective way for us to deal with environmental catastrophe now, today, in 2014? And clearly, it would be an international authoritarian regime that just dictates what to do. You, see, you can do this, you can't do that. Because environmental problems cross borders. If I throw toxic waste in the river, it goes into your country, right, that's your problem. I'm creating a problem for you. So environmental problems, difficulties with air, with land, with water, cross borders. The way to resolve these things would be uh, by instituting an international authoritarian regime, which is a horrible thing. We have to have a technical solution to a technical problem. 
And then he talks about a few other things as well. Uh, there are techniques of peace, but technique, according to a little, tends towards war. And here uh, we can cite U.S. President Eisenhower, who in his farewell speech coined the term uh, the military-industrial complex, right, briefly. Uh, we have this sort of inertia, the military industry. And the job of uh, weapons manufacturers is to produce newer and better weapons. That's just what they do. Then to produce them, we have to use them, sell them. So the military-industrial complex. And the universalization of technique tends towards this stuff. It tends to homogenize culture as well. OK. Um, possible critiques of a little. The first and most obvious critique would be that he creates this dichotomy between technical society and non-technical society. And he actually gives a date, puts this boundary at 1750. Of course, he doesn't equate the technological society with uh, the Industrial Revolution, not at all. Technique is much more all-encompassing. But to 1750, we started off with the technological society. We could suggest that that's just a false dichotomy, right? Human beings are technological animals. It's kind of one of our defining characteristics along with our opposable thumbs and our language, right? We're just technological animals. We have spears. That's high technology. Hunting is a technique. Fishing is a technique. Magic, as he himself says, is a technique because it involves the attempt to subordinate, master, manage, dominate nature by propitiating the gods or whatever. These are all technologies. So why this arbitrary boundary between technological society and non-technological society. He does actually acknowledge this, right, because he's no dummy. So we are sort of technological animals. But he gives a number of reasons why he thinks that it's justified. We can create that um, line at 1750s. For instance, ancient technologies uh, were strictly limited. <clears throat> they were bounded by geography and by culture. A technique was peculiar to a given culture. So no other culture would necessarily adopt that technique because it would amount to adopting the entire alien culture um, <clears throat> in terms of the development of the technique. That was slow. <clears throat> so we could decide whether or not we actually wanted to use that technique instead of having technique dictate to us what's going to happen next. <clears throat> so for a few different reasons, he thinks um, it's not a good objection. Ultimately kind of comes down to uh, Engels' idea. So he mentions Engels, this idea <clears throat> that change in quantity will ultimately give rise to a change in quality. Change in degree will cause change in kind. <clears throat> Scientifically speaking, right, if we just heat up water, ultimately we'll get a qualitative change. It'll change into gas, into steam. So that's Engels' law. And something like that seems to be operating <clears throat> in his theory. 1750, we get the technological society where it becomes too much. And technology is no longer a means to an end, whatever that end might be, happiness. right? The means, the techniques, are now themselves the ends. And a perfect example of this might be something like an iPhone, right? a phone is a means to communicate. But now the equation has been reversed such that communication is actually the means to the end of having an iPhone. So the means become the end. This is how technique spreads. But we can give that critique. So we're still technological animals. That's how we function. Another possible critique be like, OK, even if the means are inevitable, unavoidable. Can't we still choose the ends? Isn't that really possible? Again, online dating. I just have more dates. Now I have uh, more choice. Nuclear uh, energy. Even if he's correct about the sequence, we had to make the bomb first. Right? The nature of that technology dictates it. Still, we've only dropped the bomb twice, all of humanity. So maybe we can still choose. Um, whereas his idea here, 
groups. And if we make use of technique, we must accept the specificity and autonomy of its ends and the totality of its rules. Again, we can take uh, issue with that. We also might take issue with the idea of the natural. It tends towards that, the natural. What is the natural, really? Strictly speaking, everything exists in the universe, so everything is kind of natural in that way. We also should be careful not to essentialize human nature or nature in general, because evolution operates. The human being is not a static being. Right? Our genome itself is always changing. So this notion that we should revert to something more natural, or that there's a course that human life should follow, is perhaps problematic. And a final potential critique be the fact that it's kind of a closed issue. In a way, it's similar to psychological egoism, uh, that notion that we discuss that human beings are innately selfish. It's purely descriptive. It's just, everything is technique. Everything is technique. We're concerned with yield. We're concerned with efficiency. We just produce as much stuff as we possibly can. And he says, even when we seem to go in the opposite direction, really, it's just the calibration. It's technique self-correcting. He talks about industrial deconcentration. In the 21st century, we can say, like, we have this sustainability movement. Uh, we like organic food and that sort of thing. But really, it's just, well, technique has decided <clears throat> that from another point of view, something is actually more efficient. So we want sustainability because technique dictates that ultimately that's more efficient than industrial uh, agriculture. Now, on my accept Alul's reasoning or reject Alul's reasoning. I think it's possible to say, and many folks might, oh, okay, technique, whatever. Still, I like my iPhone, I like my iPad, my pod, I like uh, jet airplanes, I like international travel and automobiles and Facebook and so on and so forth. Even if there is a slight limitation of freedom, I still consider myself free. I don't mind technique, that's fine. In my experience talking to people, there seems to be one domain that folks are still not comfortable with, right? technique should enter. And I'm talking here about biomedical enhancement, genetic engineering. Right? This would fall under human techniques. Ultimately, the human being herself has to become the object of technique, according to the logic of the law. People seem to be a little bit uncomfortable with that. Might be good, might be bad, who knows. But if we follow Alul's logic, this sort of thing is inevitable. Just consider human sexual reproduction. Well, that is very spontaneous, very random, could go well, could not go well. There's all sorts of crazy stuff going on. Your child could be healthy or unhealthy, or tall, short, strong, weak, intelligent, dumb totally haphazard, this sexual reproduction. So why not apply technique? Why not apply rationality and get the perfect kid? Genetic engineering. When people want to reject a little, oh, I like technique, technique's fine. But they feel a little bit uncomfortable. They follow the ultimate uh, logic of his argument, the application of technique to the human being herself. OK, thank you.